We were staring at price all day and finding projects to invest in on social media and then staring at the price all day again and wondering why the price is moving. And I think that's a pretty typical pattern that you see most investors go through. They hear about something and then they go and stare at the price and buy some and think they understand why it's moving up and down. So we built this tool to look at this stuff over time and really look at a different dimension across the market. And if you are just looking at your Twitter feed, you're only gonna see who you're following a few degrees away. You're gonna guess on sentiment, you're gonna guess on engagement, and you're not gonna understand what's happening right now versus say the last year or two or three years. blockchain buddies across the globe. Welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another two mind-blowing guests, the co-founders of Lunar Crush, John and Joe. Thank you so much for coming on the show, bros. Thank you, man. I, there's no way I can match that energy right now. No <laughs> chance. I overdo myself all the time. Like, uh. So how's London, guys? How's London? Loving it, man. So much, so much energy here. This is awesome. Yeah. Love have a good time as well. I love it. I'm glad we're out here on the street, just kind of seeing people go by and the energy's been really high and the conference has been great, so. Awesome, bro. Yeah, great to finally meet you IRL, right, in real life. It's unusual these days. Unusual these <laughs> yeah. days. Yeah. So I'd love to ask you guys first question, since you're both here, everyone has their own personal story, but you guys have a dual story, right? It's like there's a bromance between you two and a lot of people out there don't really realize how important it is to be like this, like the yin and the yang when it comes to co-founders, right? One of the essences of a, of a, let's say, a healthy startup or scale up. So yeah, who would like to kick off? Well, I could start. Go for it. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a million different things that could kill a startup, right? It's like everything's working against you at all times. And it's like founder conflict, people don't talk about it as much, is the main reason that startups fail. You know, we're going on many years of working together. Um, we actually worked together before we started Lunar Crush. And John actually came up to me one day and was like, do you know what Bitcoin is? Right. And then that was just like the end of it. We just spent we were already just spitballing millions of startup ideas. Now it was just like crypto focus, spitballing millions of startup ideas. And we were going to eventually figure it out. Um, but yeah, we just we just clicked on crypto, right? Like trading first in crypto and like wanted to build something. And, you know, I think the interesting thing is like being a little bit older. I've had startups before. It's like you've been through it. You know, and you know you're not gonna just sprint into this thing and burn yourself out super fast. And like, we spend a lot of, I mean, there's been times where, you know, we're going at it, but it's more about the passion of like wanting to build the best thing possible. I think it was probably two years of talking about Bitcoin, crypto, and then it was just like something about, we, we thought well, there was like another idea we had about like tr social trading or traders or trying to hold yeah. traders accountable on yeah. social. Yeah. And then that somehow just like turned into a whiteboard of like, can we get this data? Like, can we get all of Twitter and YouTube and like the news and Reddit's data? And this is like long before Wall Street bets. And so, you know, you can't see him on camera, but our CTO sitting right over there. And <laughs> we went to him and said, dude, can you get this data? And he's like, I think I can. And then it was like, John, do you think you could like visualize how this works from a US perspective? And it was like, yeah, I think we could figure it out. And then for me, it was just like, hey, can we go raise some money and like actually turn this into something? And like the three of us just together, just it's been a perfect combination, a perfect storm, I think. What's your version, John? Yeah, I mean, it, what's, what's crazy is it was like, we knew we needed to go at Lunar Crush full time when we, were, we started working on it. And like, we were so into crypto. And what's kind of interesting from at least my own personal story is like, we, went, we got into Techstars I was the oldest person in the class. I had already made my way up a ladder in, and I had a good job. I had multiple good jobs in a row. And I said, you know what? I wanna go work in crypto. So at age 40, I started over. And I said, you know what? It's time to do something different. And I think, at least from my own experience, I would say not enough people are doing that. And, and that maturity of like working for companies that have processes that, that are, are tried, true, and tested and, and then like coming into crypto and bringing a different level into doing a startup is an interesting experience, but it's very, very helpful because it helps us to be more organized. It helps us to understand kind of from a more mature standpoint, things that maybe if you're 20, you're not gonna be thinking of, you know, and you don't have that patience and that perspective of planning and that, that strategic focus. So I think that was kind of interesting is to, to kind of um, come at this later in life 
versus so early on? Like you see so many startups in there. You know, the CEO is 20 and their executive team is in their 20s. And, and it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different kind of an of a entity when you do that. So what are you doing at Lunar Crush that helps you give quality data to everyone here? And where should people start? So you said engagement, alt ranks, any simple first steps that they can use on Lunar Crush? Well, one of the things we've, we've done is we've made it easy. Um, we, we automatically provide insights, because this is a lot of metrics. It's, it's, it's one thing to go to like a, one of the pricing websites out there and say, okay, that's the price of whatever coin today. It's another thing to have 22 different social dimensions and, and what you should look at across the 30 coins that might be your favorite. Um, so what we do is we actually surface insights across everything where there's anomalies in any metric. We bring those right to the surface. We actually leverage the power of the community to make our data stronger. So we capture about 300 million opinions and about 3 million a day. And we use that data to help train other data. We actually have a whole model that's going to get smarter over time as we implement more and more tactics. So as we grow as a brand, as we grow as a community, we're actually having that feedback from the community make the data stronger. And I think where that's really important, you know, we can't get away from the fact of, you know, there's a bot problem. Um, there's so much spam. I mean, we're, we post, and I think every post that we get gets, even with blocking a lot of these bots, it just, there's more and more, 10, 15, every single post. It's out of control. Turns out, that's actually a solvable problem. They just haven't. They just haven't. And so what's hard is solving freedom of speech. Um, when you think about that, you know, whether it's a developer putting something into place or the community participating, um, or tokenizing something like Twitter, uh, this is a huge challenge. No one solved it yet. These multi-billion dollars, some of the largest companies in the world have not solved it yet. So, you know, as, as a collective, hopefully it's something we can, we can improve upon. One thing I love about you guys is you literally have zero egos. You know, like everyone in your company feels like they're on the same team, the same squad, the same level, there's no crazy hierarchy. But for those out there who are thinking, oh, I want to be the founder or co-founder of a project and I need to find another co-founder, were there some, do you have any specific tips for people who are really looking for that perfect, you know, marriage or wedding? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I'd start with respect each other first, you know, because I think everyone's going to have conflict. Everyone. Everyone does. That's how it goes. But it's why you're fighting. And if you respect each other and you know that you're, you're arguing because you're trying to make this thing better, then I think it goes a long ways. I think that there's a lot of founders that might see a skill set in someone, but they don't particularly like them. And I think that's a big challenge. You're in, you end up spending your entire time working together just trying to overcome those issues versus trying to make a better company. And I think that's, you know, respect each other first, be friends, and don't hire too many friends. <laughs> yeah. It's one thing to be a, friend, a friendly founder. You don't want to be hiring endless friends and family that you can never fire. Discipline properly, or if you gonna, have to fire, it's not doesn't go well. <laughs> right, it's going to impact your relationship, or, or kill if it. they leave on their own, right? Right, right. So yeah, you eventually wait for them to leave on their own so you don't argue. Yeah, which so, you know, that would be is like a death spiral for a startup. Like you know, you're supposed to like if you're ever in a startup or in a small company, if there's someone or something that's just not fitting, who knows? Someone spells their name without an H and they're John, and people are like, can't live with that. It's like as soon as a person gets removed, suddenly you realize like, okay, that was just. It's just sometimes people don't fit in certain places and it just, that's just the way that it is. But I, I mean, to like expound a little bit on the, like finding a founder, I, I talk to younger founders all the time and it's one of the main things I say, it's like someone has an idea and they're like, you know, I'm gonna have 75% of the company and then I'm trying to hire a CTO. I'm like, you're trying to hire a CTO? You, you mean when, you know, you guys are running out of cash or like maybe you don't take a paycheck a couple of months that you think that the person that you're hiring that has 8% equity or 8% supply or whatever, you know, whichever direction you're going with your business, you think they're gonna work all weekend and like bust their butt to try and like build this product? Like, no, even if it's your idea, you go find one or maybe two other people and you split everything equal, right? If you want it to grow, if you want it to be your thing and like hire someone else, that's fine, but don't expect that person to be blood, sweat and tears for you and be a partner on that. And they, and they need to feel like they're part of it too. And it's their thing, which it is. It's like, the example I always give is like, if you sold half of your car to someone, like that's now their car too. Even though it was your car first, and maybe it's your baby, that's now their car. And so I think that founders have a hard time, especially when the younger feeling that, right? And feeling the second that you give away some of your company, it's now going into this ether. And like with crypto, it's even more so than that. If you have holders, 
You're going from you know a standard startup that has maybe 10, 15 people on a cap table. Now you have 50,000 overnight. Like that's a that's a lot of people to keep happy and to know. But they're investors too, and that's part. They now own part of what you created. What you're saying is kind of like when you're in the lowest lows, you need someone who will share the blood, sweat, and tears with you, right? That's you're mentioning. Is that yeah. person that's on top of you know being friends, respectful, having the same why together? And, and my brother actually, and Anthony, had very similar situations. They're already friends from the past. They moved in together and tested out living with each other for a year, full on year, and then they said, okay, we're the right yeah. co-founders. That's yeah. smart. That's that is like smart. you guys are yeah. in some ways, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, another piece here is we're all very different. I mean, we might be friends, but we're all very different. We do very different things. Our skill sets are very different. Don't hire yourself. If you hire yourself, it, you don't get that diversity. You don't get those different angles to look at. And so it's really important to, whether it's co-founders or your first few hires, Having a different, diverse set of skills makes everything better. And Divide and conquer. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I must ask you guys, transitioning towards the problems you wanted to solve in, in society as of today, obviously the technology you built it for yourselves, which is funny, most of the successful stories is, I do it for myself and I, I really need this tool, but then I want to share with others because others want that tool too. But what, what specific like, pain points did you guys identify and realize, okay, we're gonna do Lunar Crush, like with regards to data or any of these topics. We were staring at price all day, yet finding projects to invest in on social media, and then staring at the price all day again and wondering why the price is moving. And so I think that's a pretty typical pattern that you see most investors in general go through. They hear about something, and then they go and stare at the price and buy some and, and, and think they understand why it's moving up and down. So we were more after like, well, you know, how do we, make more sense of that up and down? And how do we make sense of like, as I, as I look at my feed, how many people are talking about Bitcoin today? I have no idea, right? You have no clue. We still today, most users have no idea how many people are actually talking about their coins. Excuse me, sir, you guys from America? Yes. We are, yeah. Yes. Michael Saylor. Oh, oh, nice. We all love him. You know, yeah. We love Michael Saylor too. All, all YouTubers <laughs> bullsh during the bear market. You can test them. But uh, during the bear market, Michael Saylor keep buy, buy, I buy. That's all the oh, run away, Michael run away. This is the real in, in influencer. Now nobody believes in USD anymore. In Bitcoin, we trust. Now I said Bitcoin is the king. Michael Saylor. <laughs> you. See you in Miami. We'll see yeah. Miami. <laughs> <laughs> On the street in London, I love that. We're what were we talking about? about? Um, oh, we were talking about the problems that you were trying to solve. So when we first started, we were like looking at price all day. And we were trying to make sense of why is it moving. And it just so happened at the same time we were finding out about all the crypto projects we were investing in on social media. We were trying to understand a little more about like, well, how many people are talking about Ethereum today? Um, are they unique people? You know, are they, what's the sentiment of it? Um, you know, what about the engagement? Is there a lot of engagement on posts that are about Ethereum? And so we started looking deeper and collecting the data and trying to make sense of it so that we could, I, I, A, understand, like, is there, are there legs to these projects, to their communities, um, and really look at a different dimension across the market. We tried to understand, like, you know, what exactly is it that's moving these things, and how do we find the next big project out there? Um, funny story is, like, right when we started doing that, uh, we caught Chainlink right at the beginning, because we started seeing Chainlink's community moving up a lot. We saw Solana doing the same thing. We saw Avalanche doing the same thing. And so you end up seeing with these bigger projects, they're small at some point before they're big. And as you see that, that kind of early stage growth, um, it looks a lot like continuous community growth. And so a lot of times that's happened before the price moves. Um, and it isn't like a day trade scenario. It's like a lot longer term and it's paying attention to this stuff over time. And if you are just looking at your Twitter feed, you're missing all of this. You're only gonna see who you're following a few degrees away. You're gonna guess on sentiment, you're gonna guess on engagement, and you're not gonna understand relative what's happening right now versus say the last year or two or three years. So we built this tool to look at this stuff over time and to discover new projects. And, and it works because we've been seeing it ourselves, so. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Any comments on that? Yeah, yeah I mean, just to talk about like passion and like the why, it's like, I think when you take a step back and you look at, you know, we, we saw Bitcoin come out and say like, okay, the double spend problem has been solved and you know, it's a hundred year plan, right? And so it's like, you don't really realize 
you don't, you're guessing, you're hoping that it's going to move quicker and like the, you know, the market is where it is today, which is like much further, I think, than we would ever have imagined. COVID happened, all these things happened that move that up in the timeline. But at the time it was like Bitcoin happened and we're like, this is amazing, double spend problem solved. And then once Ethereum came out and that was the first time that, you know, you kind of started this smart contract platform and more tokens. It was like, okay, I love where this industry and what, what they're, what the passion of crypto is, which is like self-sovereignty and like autonomy over like your decisions, autonomy over your money. And like, we love where that was going. And then it was like, well, where could our talents and what are we good at? How can we push this industry forward? And where are the gaps, right? And it just, I think it just naturally comes down to like, we're doing something that we're good at in the space that we want to be in and pushing that industry forward in a way that we love because we believe in the industry as a whole. We believe in the mission of Bitcoin and crypto as a whole and Web3. And we're just now evangelizing it through the company that we built and the token that we've launched. And like, that's where it comes down to it. And it's like, now it's just like, this is just a super fun problem to solve every day in the industry, having fun with the people that are also passionate about it. And it's like, I think it's like everyone that, meet in the industry that's been here a long time it's like it all just kind of comes back to that you fell in love with the industry and then if you were an entrepreneur you went and tried to solve a problem in it and like where do your talents fit for that problem and i think we've We've been pretty fortunate to like find a, a nice niche for ourselves. A very nice niche indeed. And you know, I know like when we were talking about this earlier, John, a lot of people over rely maybe on technical analysis and don't, I mean, the whole concept of social sentiment or sentiment analysis is still a bit new, right? It's not something that many people are aware of. If you don't mind explaining maybe what you were mentioning earlier about the limitations of technical analysis and how do you see sentiment analysis or social sentiment playing a, a role here in, in understanding these coins and tokens. So I think, let's say someone becomes sustainable in the crypto space, and they're in this for multiple years. Within that period of time, you might do technical analysis many times. You might say, at this moment in time, for the next period of time, here's what I think happens. If you did technical analysis on Bitcoin for the rest of your life, you're just gonna do a big arrow up probably, right? So a lot of it is like, that's a really short term perspective to do technical analysis. There's swings in that, and you can take advantage of those swings, sure. But it's, it's kind of more like it's an idea of what may happen. It may be right, it may be wrong. There may be macro factors that impact that technical analysis, and you're totally off. That happens all the time. In fact, that happens more often than people are right. And so it's sort of like if you look at social wrapped around that, you might still be doing technical analysis as an idea, but if you wrap social around your strategy and look at the metrics, you have to understand like what is moving these coins. Price does not move itself. Volume does not create itself. What is happening? And, and I, I think when you look at, say for example, like look at the number of wallets on a project. Well, those people with wallets on that project are going to talk about that project. They're gonna talk about it more than they're not gonna talk about it. And so if you look at that community growth over time, it correlates very heavily to the number of wallets. It correlates very heavily to the number of holders. It correlates very heavily to the number of exchanges that list a coin, because it also just so happens that exchanges don't want to list coins that have no community. And so it, it kind of all works together as this cycle. So if you're only looking at price, price does not create itself. Community creates price. Community creates, vo creates volume in exchange listings. And so I think even if you're doing TA, you should look at this all together as like another piece of your analytics arsenal to like say, well, what is happening out there? because 90% of your day is not spent trading, it's spent being in that community. And so the trade takes a few minutes and half of it's set and forget, right? And so you need, to, you need to participate. Well, you have to participate effectively. And so I think more than anything, social analytics should be the number one thing that people are looking at and then trade. And then trade, yeah. So versus the other way around. You know, we kind of coined this phrase, without a community, there, there is no crypto, right? And that kind of like stemmed from this idea of you know, there are no earnings reports, there are no 10Ks for a lot of these projects. And like some of the founders are not even doxxed and it's a pseudo anonymous avatar that you're investing in, right? And if we believe in this world that everything's gonna be tokenized in one way, shape or form, how do you, where's the transparency? How do you know what's going on? And we're now in a, like a, a world where Robinhood investor, everyone's gonna invest, everyone's gonna have just a little bit more autonomy over their portfolio. And so you have to have these tools that are creating transparency where how do I know who the people are that are talking about these projects? How do I know if, hey, I got a text or a WhatsApp from someone and they told me about this one project that looks really promising. Where do you go? 
right? How do you know what the community looks like on top of that? And know like, is anyone talking about this? Are there a couple influencers or KOLs that talked about it and just tried to pump this thing? Like, how do you protect yourself from this world where it's the unknown? And so what we're trying to do is take a little of the anxiety out of investing in cryptocurrency because you know, we've been in this space a long time. We know the founders, we know the people, we know there's some of the smartest people in the world, they're in this space and there's so much opportunity. And it's the first time ever that we have this democratization of opportunity of investing. It's not one person putting $300,000 into Coinbase and now making 4 billion. You know, it's a bunch of people putting $5 in that can now buy a new house. That's the world I think that we all wanna live in and I think that's a better place. And so we're just trying to be one piece of that puzzle to help solve, you know, the anxiety of, I don't know what the heck is going on over here. And I think everyone should know. And we're, we're building tools that institutions and hedge funds, they've had some shape of this for a long time. Again, just another edge for the big guy. Um, so we're trying to bring that down so that every retail investor, every person can have access to the same tools in a new asset class that you know is changing the world and moving very fast. That makes a lot of sense. And, and that's really the meaning of what we're doing like for all of us, I, I hope, uh, within this community. And I love to follow up with the specific social analytics. What are the maybe the top three data sets I should start with to start thinking, okay, I've been doing TA forever, but now I need more tools to make better decisions. Uh, let's kick off with you. The crypto industry itself is underserved. Um, there's not enough applications, not enough tools, not enough um, ability to gain awareness as a new project, and we want to help them. Thank you so much for watching the show. We love you for all the support and tune in next week for the next episode of Kryptonites.